dysphagia prevalence is around 10 to 30 percent in older adults, whereas when you look at the general population, it's around 3 percent. And so and this is now considered a geriatric syndrome because of its significant impact on morbidity, mortality, uh, as well as the high prevalence in older adults. My name is Dr. Shanojian Thiagalingam. I'm a geriatrician. I'm also an assistant professor of medicine at West Virginia University. I'm also a recent graduate at the Mayo Clinic Geriatrics Fellowship Program. Our review article is titled Dysphagia in Older Adults, and it'll be appearing in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Now, when we look at uh, morbidity, uh, there is a higher prevalence of pneumonias, for example. There's 3.3 times higher prevalence. There is also increased prevalence of malnutrition. There's also an increased prevalence of institutionalization, up to 33% more in uh, older adults with dysphagia. There is also an increased rate of uh, mortality of 1.7 times higher uh, rates. Uh, we all hope to also have uh, the readers understand both compensatory strategies of management, such as caregiver offering smaller and uh, slower feeding. Uh, modified dietary options should also be understood. And secondly, rehabilitative strategies should also be uh, understood because these can be offered to older adults. And this includes, for example, McNeil's dysphagia therapy. Now, when we look at the overview of our paper, we highlight several high yield areas. This includes age related changes of swallowing. We also discuss the three different types of dysphagia, including oral dysphagia, pharyngeal dysphagia, as well as esophageal dysphagia. Our focus in our paper is more in the oral pharyngeal dysphagia sections. We also explore the causes of each type uh, and we also go into key history-taking questions that one would want to explore. The five key questions include what happens during swallowing? Uh, is the patient having trouble chewing? Uh, how do they tolerate solids versus liquids? As well as symptom duration and frequency, as well as associated symptoms. Now, we also discussed some of the high yield key warning signs that one would want to look for. These include, for example, increased throat clearing, drooling, and repetitive swallowing. As mentioned previously, we discussed some of the clinical trials, including one uh, regarding bedside swallowing uh, with water. And it's a very easy test that can be done, both in the inpatient and outpatient settings, and it can give a provider an easy understanding of whether the patient has uh, easily, identifiable, easily identifiable signs of dysphagia. We also explore the compensatory and rehabilitative strategies of treatment and discuss the emerging roles of technology. For example, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, um, although they have not currently shown significant benefit for patients, it is still an emerging um, uh, field in the field of dysphagia. So what does this mean for patients? Well, when it, in general, when it comes to progressive chronic conditions uh, or chronic diseases like dementia, there is no cure for dysphagia. However, there are many uh, treatment strategies that patients can pursue and management strategies that patients can pursue that the provider can um, discuss. And it's also important to understand that tube feeding in older adults, especially those with dementia or those with dementia in nursing homes, may actually cause more harm than benefit. And one such study, uh, based on a minimal data set study, found that over 97,000 patients that were uh, reviewed, there was 64% mortality one year after inserting tube feeds in those nursing home patients with dementia. It's also important to have early goals of care discussion to help patients avoid hasty decisions uh, when they're acutely ill and avoid harmful interventions. So early goals of care discussions are important. Other key findings that are important for patients to understand is the structured 
rehabilitation program. One such example was demonstrated successfully in Poland through a randomized clinical trial where stroke patients were treated for 10 days in hospital and five days in the outpatient setting caregiver education, swallowing, compensatory training, and rehabilitative exercise strategies were pursued. And in that study, they found improved cough, swallowing reflex, as well as swallowing time. So how does this relate to clinical practice? Well, dysphagia has a higher prevalence in older adults, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. And understanding some of the exam findings that we look for, as well as doing bedside testing such as the bedside water swallow testing and in addition understanding key diagnostic modalities such as the video fluoroscopic swallow study helps in clinical practice. It's also important for providers to know that the emerging uh, roles of technology in the dysphagia field uh, given that it's a small field and it's growing it's very interesting to see where technology will take this field in the future. It's first important to understand currently what are the primary diagnoses associated with dysphagia uh, to understand the prevalence of various medical illnesses uh, in dysphagia. Additionally, it's also important to understand the, the concept of muscular rehabilitation programs and trying a structured um, concept in North America. Current studies have been done in Europe and trials to be done in North America may give clinicians and patients more hope in treatment strategies for dysphagia. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.